conflict is an opportunity to have a difficult conversation that ultimately is going to lead us to be closer as a team to accomplish a goal to solve a problem. And so I love the opportunities that I get to manage conflict because I know it's going to ultimately make us all stronger. And I think that's a quality in leaders that's necessary is to be willing to kind of go through the trenches sometimes and deal with those difficult situations because something good is always going to come out of it. Welcome to Show Your Receipts, where we believe if you can see it, you can be it. Receipts are evidence or proof that something has occurred. Our guests are evidence that Black excellence is alive and well. They will be sharing their receipts on how they've been able to accomplish so much in their life. I'm your host, Tony Jackson. Let's get started. Welcome to Show Your Receipts, where we believe if you can see it, you can be it. I'm excited to read the bio of our guest today, uh, Ms. Alexis Steinbach from Davenport, Iowa. Uh, she was a two-sport letter winner at Wisconsin in, in sports of volleyball and track and field. She completed her volleyball career as a four-letter winner and two-time All-Big Ten pick at middle blocker. In track and field, she competed in long jump and had several Big Ten championship appearances. She received her Bachelor's of Science degree in Consumer Affairs from the School of Human Ecology at University of Wisconsin-Madison and her Master's of Science degree in Educational Leadership and Policy Analysis from the School of Education at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Alexis has a dynamic career in higher education and currently serves as the Director of Pre-Business Certificate and Transfer Advising in Wisconsin School of Business. Alexis resides in Verona, Wisconsin, with her three children, Maya, age four, Dietrich, age two, Xander, age two, and husband, Derek, who's also a former U University of Wisconsin men's track and field letter winner. And we have Ms. Steinbach here today. I'm excited to have you. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I am doing very well. That is an incredible and very impressive bio. Before we get started, I want to say this. Uh, you and your husband, you guys have some incredible potential athletes uh <laughs> in the in the making so i'm just seeing <laughs> track athlete volleyball like i got a contract they can sign right here so we can yeah let's hope i mean we'll see I, i'm open to whatever their interests are but my heart will hurt if not one of them ends up being an athlete that would be surprising that would be surprising the genetics are definitely you guys' favor so let's hop right into it it's something that i've been interested to chat with you about. I think I just talked mentioned it on camera. I'm a huge fan of reading business books and watching uh, business cast. I believe, like Mark uh, Cuban says, that business is the number one sport. It's 365 days a year. The rules are always changing. It's massive competition. And University of Wisconsin Business School, the school that is your employer that you work with closely, has had tremendous success and generating CEOs who Fortune 500 CEOs who are kind of like the the professional athletes of of CEOs playing in the big leagues. Talk to me about your time working at University of Wisconsin Business School. How you got started there? What you learned? What you like about the school? All of those good, all that good stuff. Yeah, no, thanks for for asking that question. And it's always great to see like the Wisconsin School of Business out in the media and in the news, we work really hard right now to become a top 10 program. And my role in the School of Business is very student facing. So my unit supports students who are currently at UW-Madison and they're applying to get into the School of Business. It's a competitive program. And that's a lot of the reason why I was drawn to work at the school, at the Wisconsin School of Business. Naturally, obviously, I'm a competitive person. But the school business has a lot to offer students, the staff as well, just in terms of resources, support. I like the environment and the culture of competition because oftentimes in higher education in this day and age, I think competition can get kind of a negative connotation where I see that as a positive for students that we're really helping them see how you can be competitive. You still can be supportive. I enjoy the innovation that we're able to have. So a lot of my role is focused on policies, 
surrounding how do students get in and achieve a business degree or something similar. And so I've been able to have quite an impact on making our policies more equitable and accessible to all students at UW-Madison and developing stronger and deeper campus partnerships so that more students have access to the great resources that we have at the School of Business. So yeah, I've enjoyed it. I've really grown in my role. It's my first time as a supervisor. Um, So taking that on, and I started this job during COVID, right coming right off of maternity leave with my daughter, Maya. So it was just an interesting introduction into a new role, new responsibilities. Um, But I love the people. Um, And that's really what makes working at the School of Business exciting for me is the people that I get to walk in to the office with every day and work with. And we all have a shared vision of making the School of Business a top 10 program and also just making it a better place for all the students and staff that that's incredible. And so it's, I guess it's widely known, or it wasn't known to me how competitive a University of Wisconsin is. You said you, you work on the student face inside, you work with a lot of students. What does it take? So imagine if it's somebody who's watching this, who's maybe uh, con- considering applying, they're a year away, a few years away, or maybe they've applied, they been rejected. What does it take to actually get into this school? Yeah, I, I'm not giving away any trade secrets, so I'm, I'm not putting, I'm not an admissions counselor or anything like that. But what I see, and I think that for any student that's currently in college or planning to apply to college, is like being able to be confident in yourself and what you're bringing and fighting against peer comparison is critical to be successful. I see it every day where students are so worried about what somebody else is doing or what internship they have or what experiences they have. And then they're not focusing on the person themselves. That's important. And being able to articulate and show through your life and personal experiences, what makes you unique, what makes you different and putting that in your essays and writing about it is so valuable because a lot of the other things are just the numbers. GPA is a number. There's going to be a ton of people with the same GPA. Um, But there's only one you. And so as much as young students and and young kids that are thinking about college can be confident in who you are and what you've done and secure in that. And then just when it's time to apply to school or apply for that job, you just have to show up as yourself and be in anyone that's reading an essay or interviewing you. They want to know the real you. And so, like, I tell students that all the time, just be comfortable being yourself, which is a message that I think just oftentimes gets lost in this competitive environment. You mentioned you mentioned the word competitive a few times now. And so I wonder if your sports background has something to do with that. Talk to me about being a former student athlete and what role that has played in your perception of uh, competition, because I truly believe that people underestimate the value and the grit and the the potential that comes with the student athlete. Even if people put so much in grades are very important, but it's something about working together in a team and experiencing losses and failing publicly and bouncing back from that and managing the rigors of the schedule. Talk to me about your experience as a student athlete and how it's helped you become the person you are today and holding the position that you hold today. Yeah, all of what you just said, like as a student athlete, you're excited about the opportunity to compete at the highest level possible. And through that, part of the job, um, because it it is kind of like having a job while also being a student, is that you have to balance competing priorities. You're dealing with different people. You bring in new athletes, new teammates every year, coaching staff, and it's not all sunshine and rainbows especially not for me. I, I definitely had a up and down journey when I was at Wisconsin and really had to do self-reflection and understand what I wanted and what kind of teammate I needed to be for the whole group, the collective. So a lot of the qualities that I feel like I possess and really hone those skills as a student athlete are so present in my life today, especially in my current role supervising a team of folks because I'm leading a team just like you would be as a team captain or a coach of a team. And so I take pieces from that background and I implement it on a daily basis. And one thing that I've recognized 
for sure is how do you get everyone on a team, regardless of their experience level, their background and where they came from, what their personal and professional career goals to focus and be able to lock in on like one collective mission. And that's what I love to do is really getting that buy in from folks on my team, allowing them to be creative, giving them opportunities to lead because I lead from behind. This isn't my my unit's not about me. It's about all of the people that are doing the direct work and I'm there to support them and work toward a created shared vision. I also think like part of being a student athlete is that you do have to go through those rough moments where maybe you have to challenge a teammate or you have to challenge your coach in a respectful way. And I think in a workplace environment, being able to not be this idea of conflict is something that everyone's like, oh, I don't want to touch that. Or I'm afraid of I'm conflict avoidant. And I just yes, there's a thing, a such thing as that. But you just can't be right. Conflict is an opportunity to have a difficult conversation that ultimately is going to lead us to be closer as a team to accomplish a goal to solve a problem. And so I love the opportunities that I get to manage conflict because I know it's going to ultimately make us all stronger. And I think that's a quality in leaders that's necessary is to be willing to kind of go through the trenches sometimes and deal with those difficult situations because something good is always going to come out of that. Wow. That your perception on conflict, have you always been that way? Is that something like it ain't your personality? Do you feel like you develop that through you laugh. <laughs> yeah, you it's laugh? funny. I, it's funny because I, I definitely have not always managed conflict the way that I do now in my professional life. I never, I wouldn't say that I was the type of person that would ever avoid it, but I do think there's good ways and bad ways to approach conflict. And maybe in my yeah. past, I didn't know the best ways. So I laugh because when I look back, I'm like, I wish that I did know what I know now about handling conflict. Um, But I think a lot of it is being able to separate yourself from what that conflict is and not take things personally. And that's something I think, whether you're on a team or you're working or you're going through it, you just have to be able to understand that, like, not everything is personal, not everything's about you. And everyone's dealing with different things and approaching things a different way. So I've just learned in my professional career that when conflict comes up, I don't go right away to like, why is this happening to me or what is it about me? I just think about, okay, what's the situation Mm -hmm. and how could we come up with a solution or how can I work with this person to solve whatever this conflict is? What kind of player were you, Alexis? Were you a fiery, passionate type of player? Yes, to not like continue with the word competitive. But yeah, I like, I do not believe... You're it's dropping slow. a lot of hits. You're dropping a lot of hits. You said competitive probably 10 times since we started talking. I'll, I'll chill and, out. No, 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 no. I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. Okay. Yeah, I, will, I mean, I don't believe in, in playing sports not to win. And mm. I think that every time you step on the court, you had yeah. that's the goal, right? You, you want to beat yeah. the other team. You want to win. You want to play your best. Um, and so I was competitive and I think like that's the beauty of sports and athletics mm-hmm. is that you can you're almost like a different version of yourself mm-hmm. and you can just let go. And it, I mm-hmm. think it's the same as like someone who's an entertainer or a singer, like mm-hmm. as an athlete, you're performing and you're you're in this mentality or you have this persona and competitiveness it just fuels you like it mm-hmm. makes you want to work hard and you want to be mm-hmm. next to someone that you know is going to like go to battle with you. So I never stepped on the court and wasn't excited to be there and grateful to be be in that position. But yeah, I, and I'm still competitive to this day, even with Lexus. You got, me, you, you got me ready to lace them up right now. Oh, Alexis. I like yeah. want people to just like run through a wall with you or whatever. It's, right. It's, it's awesome. Well, I always had a coach who said, I would rather have a player that I need to calm down than someone I have to get up for the occasion. Yeah. Let's talk about your, you're obviously were a, you obviously were a standout athlete in high school, but you don't get a, a division one scholarship unless you are. I always talk about my welcome to college moment as a student athlete. I remember playing high school. I didn't play high school football until I was in the 11th grade. 
And it just kind of came natural to me. I didn't really play in a big conference. We didn't have a lot of competition. I didn't know that at the time. And then I go to college and this guy was Mr. Football in his high school. And this guy was this. And I'm just like, wow, I'm like the one of the worst players now for the first time ever. Talk to me about, did you ever have, what was your welcome to college moment where it's like, this is not high school anymore? Yeah, that I would say it, a lot of similarities. I was recruited out of high school. I had some great opportunities and found Wisconsin and really fell in love with the campus. And I didn't know, you know, what I didn't know. I always was a, a good player on my club team in my high school. And then I'll never forget, like I got to our first preseason practice and the sheer speed of the game like I was taken aback immediately and in that first week of preseason and I came in and they told me we're going to redshirt you give you some time to develop you're just you're really raw and athletic um, but we have to work on those specific skills and my blocking and technique and things like that and I'll never forget I was in a drill and it was so fast that like my head was spinning and I couldn't keep up and I'm around girls who are high school all Americans and everyone's taller and bigger than me. And I'm just like, what am I doing here? And I, I kind of had that moment of like, am I like, am I cut out for this? And I remember I like left the court because I didn't want anyone to see me cry. And I went into the like corridor in the field house and I just like got my tears out. And I was like, no, like, I was supposed to be here. They brought me here. All I can do is work as hard as possible. And I went back out there. And like two, three weeks later, they pulled my red shirt and I was starting. And the rest was history. But it was important, I think, for me to have that moment because everyone who goes to the Division One level was the best or at least the best where they were. And you don't realize that there's a process you really have to trust to get better and the game is just different everyone is big everyone's fast everyone has played well and so I was glad that I had a coaching staff that really believed in me and guided me through that process to help make me the volleyball player that I became when you were a kid who were your early heroes who did you look up to like man maybe one day like who who were those people for you that's a good question so I watched I feel like when I was a kid I mean, I loved sports. We watched every sport there was. I watched a ton of track. So seeing people like Marion Jones, Allison Felix, like from the time that she started her career to the time she ended her career, I've just followed her. Lisa Leslie, like Dawn Staley, who's like now coaching and leading um, South Carolina in the tournament. And so seeing all these like strong black women and female athletes like be successful always fueled me to want to be competitive. And volleyball was actually not a sport that like from a young age I watched or was involved in. And it wasn't really a diverse sport. I felt like as I was growing up, but luckily I had in Iowa, there's a really strong volleyball community in the high school I went to had a great program. And it combined a lot of things. So that's how I got involved in it. But those are some of the examples of women that I just saw compete at a really high level. And the Olympics is just like anybody I'm watching in the Olympics. And I watched every single sport, gymnastics, swimming, volleyball. I just loved seeing how competitive it was and seeing athletes that are just at like the peak of their careers and performing at the highest level was so motivating to like want to be become the best athlete that I could be. I'm going to ask the obvious question, something that some people will sit think is obvious. Why not basketball? <laughs> That's a great question. So my dad played basketball. My sister played. My younger brother plays now in college. And I just like it never clicked with me. Like, I played basketball in middle school. I liked the physical side of it. But there was just something about volleyball I was more drawn to. And for whatever reason, basketball just, like, it didn't click. It wa- it wasn't my thing. And I didn't – I definitely am not the type of person that can just do something to do it. So 
when I found volleyball, I just sort of never looked back. And then I was able to continue with track and really focus on being honing in my skills on those two sports. I think that, again, we've already mentioned this, but a common theme uh, this of our conversation so far has been competition. Um, talk to me about the transfer from athletic competition to your transition from academic side of University of Wisconsin. What was that like? Did you still have that? Did you bring that same competitive fire to the classroom? And yeah, talk to me about that. Yeah, I I think that college is full of transitions, right? And a lot of times as a student athlete, your priority is your sport and you're going there to compete and to do well. I was very fortunate that at a school like Wisconsin, the amount of resources I had access to, to not only help me athletically, but even more resources to help me academically were there and in place because it was a really big struggle for me. Like I was a great student in high school and I never really had issues, but college is different. Like you're in a class with 400 people. You don't know what to take notes on. You don't know what exams are going to be like. And so I had some tough love from my academic advisor. And till this day, her and I still are connected um, because she really helped me understand that, like, you can do this, but it's going to look different than anything you've done before. Um, And taking advantage of resources doesn't mean maybe I had teammates who didn't need tutoring or who didn't need a mentor or somebody to keep them organized. But I knew I had to be comfortable knowing that that's what I needed for myself to be successful. And once I surrounded myself with the right resources and engaged with them, I was able to both be successful competitively on the court and then also in the classroom. And a big part for me with college was discovering, like, what is it that I even like and that I'm genuinely interested in? Because if I don't like it, it's never going to be fun. It's never going to feel good. And so then I ultimately found my major in the School of Human Ecology and I loved it. Like it was very business adjacent, but it had a human centered approach. And I felt like it wasn't school when I was in those classes and that I was just learning stuff that I had a genuine interest in. And so that really helped me. But freshman year was rough. I like was not, I definitely was not applying myself in the right way. And then you have all the other things and extracurriculars of college life that you want to enjoy because it's four years that, that you're there and then it's done. So I had my fun, but I, I understood what work hard, play hard meant when you were at Wisconsin very quickly. Man, of all the, cause again, I went to Iowa. Of all the away games that we played, Wisconsin was an experience. The drive from the hotel to the stadium was crazy. You just saw red just all over places, sea of red. I mean, the intensity of the crowd, those are some of the toughest, toughest games to play against. So I have much respect uh, to University of Wisconsin, much respect to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So talk to me about... Because well, what I'm interested in is when you're playing a sport like volleyball, before I misspeak, is there a professional bo- women's volleyball league? Yeah, there. I would say actually in like the last two to three years, women's volleyball has become more and more popular year after year after year. The te- like it's televised, Wisconsin's obviously like leading the pack on <laughs> putting vo- women's college volleyball on the map. But now there are, are two well, really kind of three women's professional leagues in the U.S. because most women would have to leave the U.S. and play professionally overseas where there was a more solidified professional volleyball community. And now there's going to be a team in Madison. And so it's crazy to see the investment that folks have made in women's sports. Kevin Durant is one of the investors in the organization that is opening up different professional women's leagues all across the country. So yeah, now there's a lot more opportunities for women who want to play after college. So the question I was going to ask is what is the big dream? Like you're 18. Cause I know going to college as a football player, the big dream is okay. I'm going to go to college. I'm going to get drafted. I'm going to have this long, great NFL career and all the things that may come along with that. We're going in as a top volleyball prospect. Is the end goal, I'm going to get a uh, free education and maybe get a 
a graduate degree? Is the end goal I'm gonna become a coach? Like, what's the big goal for a lot of people? Maybe you or some of the teammates you had. Yeah, I think the reality as, as a female athlete was professional sp- sports. Like, there is no NFL vo- volleyball. Like, I'm I'm hopeful that these new leagues will create that, and I think that there's a lot of success already. Um, but for me, it was get my degree and not put my mom in any kind of debt, go to college for free, get a good education, and then be able to provide a better life for myself and support myself and have a successful career. I didn't really consider playing. Like I I, I would have enjoyed it, I think. And I think some some athletes will are for sure like I'm gonna play pro overseas and have a great career and you get to travel the world, you get to live in beautiful places and I think that there's nothing to replace that experience. There's a lot of girls now too, young ladies that are going and playing beach volleyball because you have the A V P circuit. So that's a great way as well. But I you know, I really think it depends on the person. And a lot of that you discover like as you're in school. And if you're playing pro, you know that your career is not going to last forever. The same with the NFL, NBA, whatever it may be. So how are you setting yourself up for your future long term? Um, And so, I mean, I think every young girl that's playing volleyball aspires to be on the Olympic team. There's like 15, 17 roster spots on that and thousands and thousands of great volleyball players. So you kind of can see the writing on the wall pretty quickly of if that's going to be in your future or not. But I think it's just being able to play at a high level, have the most success possible, and then ultimately leave with a great college education and a job that's going to set you up for your future. I got a theory that I want to get your, I want to get your opinion on. So I actually think that that's kind of like a gift and a curse, right? When you go to college and play football, every single person in my recruiting class thought they were going to the NFL. If you hook them up to a lie detector test and literally like forensic check there, they would not be lying. They would say, I am going to the NFL. And I think that because the idea of the NFL, same with the basketball players, what's interesting, you realize in college when they talk about the team GPAs, the girls' teams' GPAs are always higher. And I think because a lot of them know that that big payday is not down the road. So I really need to buckle down and, and take school seriously where so many guys are walking around with their head in the clouds, chasing a dream that even if it happens, it won't take care of them forever. Well, what do you think about my theory? What are your thoughts? I think that it's, yeah, of course. Like we're, I think women sometimes, and I, I'm not making a, a sweeping generalization, but like maybe there's a little bit more re- realism and like what is the situation? Multitasking comes a little bit easier to us as I think about me and well, the difference myself and my my wife great guys that can multitask and i know there's realistic people and athletes out there but i do think it's just like i think a lot of it is like also like society like there's been just so much focus on male athletes in the nfl the nba the money the coverage so why wouldn't you desire that right why wouldn't you go all in thinking that that's what you're going to be because to some degree you need to manifest it but like Every student athlete has sat in a room where they've heard only 1% of you are going pro and only 1% of you really got here in the first place. So it's like to be the 1% of 1% sounds wildly unrealistic. And so I think that there's a balance there. I also think it's like important for coaches, parents, everyone to also be realistic and there's nothing to say, like, don't achieve your dreams. Like my, I think about my brother, like, he tells me he wants to be in the NBA. I'm going to 100% support that. But we always will have that conversation about even if you make it, the NBA doesn't last forever, right? So then what? What are you going to do? What is your backup plan? How are you setting yourself up for the rest of your career? No one can play a, a sport. I mean, you can play a sport for a long time. You can't make money playing a sport forever. And so I just think it's it's really not wanting to crush dreams, but balancing being realistic and then just setting up a plan to be successful. What do I need to know about you as a child to understand the woman that you are today? 
Well, you may want to ask Sherry Mitchell, my mom, from what she's told me, I maybe wasn't the easiest. But <laughs> I know that I was a little stubborn, maybe a little headstrong, kind of wanted things my way. I don't know if any of those things have changed drastically in my adult life, maybe just more digestible. But yeah, I, I grew up raised by a single mother, my sister and I, and my mom taught me from a very young age to be independent work ethic and I she modeled all of those things standing up for myself like working hard and never letting anybody really dictate how I was going to move through the world or what I was going to do or what opportunities I would get and one of the things that I always think about now that I work in a professional environment is how much my mom instilled in me the principles of professionalism and from the perspective of how I would be viewed in the world as a young black woman and as a black woman now of how people, the things that people will assume about me or say about me and not giving them the ability to do those things. And I'm so, so grateful for my mom on a daily basis for her teaching me those things and teaching me how to present myself and teaching me to be confident and never ashamed of who I was And if people don't accept me for who I am, that's their problem, right? That's not mine. So I I was really lucky to be given those tools by my mom, the belief that she had in me. And to this day, like, it's just amazing for her to be able to see how far I've come and the life that I've been been able to create. And now I have a daughter who's four years old that I'm instilling instilling those same values in. And it's just... Amazing to see a comfortable circle. And even in the moments where I didn't want to hear my mom tell me those things, looking back on it, I know that it was all to make me the person who I am today. Talk to me about Iowa, because before I came to Iowa, I'm from Ypsilanti, Michigan. It's a kind of Metro Detroit-ish. And I didn't know there were Black people in Iowa, first of all. I didn't know that. And one of my first defining moments in Iowa, I will never forget this, my freshman year, me and my roommate, he got dreadlocks. He from he got gold teeth. He from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and he and I are studying in like the little lounge at the end of the hallway. And this white girl comes in, and she's being kind of weird, but she's friendly, and we eventually end up chatting a little bit. She tells me and my friend, me and my roommate, that we're the first black people she's ever spoke to in her life. She said, I've seen, and her exact words were, I've seen you guys on TV and movies before, but I've never seen you in person. So with all of that backdrop, you being a black person from Iowa, and by the way, you're the second black person I've had from Iowa on this podcast. We've actually had somebody else who's from Des Moines. But talk to me about your experiences growing up in Iowa as as a black woman and as a black girl. Yeah, so Davenport, part of the Quad Cities, I was quite diverse. I went from growing up in the Quad Cities to Iowa to come to UW-Madison, which was much less diverse than the environment that I grew up in. And I had friends from a variety of backgrounds, played sports with everyone. There was nothing that I would say was like predominantly one race necessarily. And so it I always tell, like, because people, when they hear I'm from Iowa, they always assume that, right? Like, it must have been... Like, just you. And I'm like, it, Davenport, the Quad Cities, like, created this really nice, diverse, like, a, for socioeconomic status. It just, it was a great place, honestly, for me to grow up. Great schools. I had a great education. Um, and I was able to really learn and experience what people from all different walks of life were. So when I did transition to going to UW, which was less diverse, for me, it wasn't as big of a shock as some folks that I knew and friends that I had that came from areas that were not predominantly white and they had never been in that. And so in some ways I was able to help some of my friends or people who just didn't have those experiences because of the diversity that I grew up in. So I would, I would say that I like, I was fortunate, but that's like not representative of the entire state of Iowa by any means, but I was lucky to to grow up in that environment. So I, I, I want to get your thoughts on something. If you had to put your finger on, in your role as a counselor, as an advisor, and working with students, 
But what would you say is a commonality of failure? Because they talk a lot about what's the commonality of success. And Charlie Munger, one of my favorite people to learn from, he says that you always want to invert a problem if you want to uh, get true clarity on it. And so what do you see? What are the things that you see people doing that cause them to fail when they're trying to get in the University of Wisconsin Business School? Or maybe they're already in the business school or maybe when you were a student athlete. What are some of those things? I think one of the biggest thing is fear. Like there, people are so afraid to fail that inevitably that's what's going to happen. And it's going to feel a whole lot worse when you don't intend for that to happen. You're trying to, this is like avoiding failure. And I just don't think that you can become a better person whether you're trying to get into school or you're trying to get a job or whatever, like you have to fail. And that's part as a student athlete, like you experience so much failure and you're, you grow a resiliency to failure. You also lose that fear of failing because in order to, to be successful, you have to be willing to take a risk and that risk. Sometimes the results of that will be failure. So I think it's that. And I, and I think another Part of failing is that like an unwillingness to then change, right? Or to take that accountability. So if you fail at something, it can't be everybody else's problem. And I see that all the time. Like, well, this happened or this. It's like, no, but it's you, right? So what are you willing to do to improve it or to fix it so that you don't fail again? But personal accountability is another like, important characteristic and important trait that I try to instill in any student that I meet with. Because if you can show someone that you can be accountable, anybody can work with you and coach you and help you and help you to improve. But if you're unwilling to take that personal accountability for failure, for something that happens, it's really going to limit and hinder your ability to be successful in life. If you had to go back and advise the 18-year-old Alexis, You can sit her down. Now, I know you're still very young. Obviously, you have a long career and a lot of life lessons and and wisdom ahead of you. But if you had to sit down, 18-year-old, competitive Alexis, coming from Davenport, headed to Madison, what advice would you give her? That's a good one. I feel like I actually reflect on that a lot because I tell students so many things that I never would have taken that advice when I was in school. (laughs) I think the first thing for sure is prioritize building strong relationships. I think early on in my college career, I undervalued relationships and having good ones um, with teammates and just coaches and like relationships take a lot of work, right? Marriages take a lot of work. Any kind of relationship you're in with someone takes work. And when you're younger and you're a little bit more mature, that work may not seem necessary, but that's definitely a lesson I would tell myself. I also would have told myself to invest more into my future and figuring out what it is that I wanted to do, whether that was doing like informational interviews and networking with people. And as a student athlete, you're, you you know that there's all these people who want to hire you because you have this great work ethic and all of these things, but it doesn't just happen, right? Like you have to put yourself out there. And so it would have been like, be curious, figure out like, what do people do? Why do they do it? What do they like about their jobs? Because finding a career path isn't easy to do. Like, I think a lot of students come into college now, especially I see with like, this is what I'm doing in my career. And I'm like, that's amazing. You've also never done it. So you don't, what happens if you don't like it, right? And so it's being able to be curious and then create a plan for like what you want to do as you gather that information. And that's not stuff that you're going to learn in a classroom. Like, it's just going to be through the people you meet, going to different events and all these programs that folks put on to really help students find that. Alexis, talk to me about mentorship, because I would be interested to get your thoughts on what mentorship means to you, what role that it has played or has not played in your life. To me, I believe that anything that I've accomplished in my life can be directly connected to three to five key mentors, whether that's Mm -hmm. athletics, my marriage physical health, all of that. What are your thoughts on mentorship and what role has it played in your life? Yeah, I think 
having mentors is extremely important to get through life, right? And mentors look, can look and be different things at different points in your life. I don't, I think oftentimes there's this expectation that you need to seek out a mentor and there needs to be this regular occurring meetings and follow-ups and all that. And a lot of like when I was in college, that's how mentorship was talked about. But I believe in mentorship being organic. So maybe I only have a conversation with somebody once, but I'm taking a lesson from that person that still is a part of my life today and that then I'm passing on. And so I think mentorship is something sometimes you're looking for, but most of the time you don't even realize it's happening, but it is. And I like supervisors that I've worked for have been mentors to me without knowing it or without me directly saying it. So I think it's important. It's valuable. I I think mentorship programs and or, organized mentorship can be really great if done well and if you're really invested in it. But I also think it it's okay to just have a relationship with someone, right? And, and you may call them your mentor or you may have that type of dynamic and that can reverse too. Like I feel like I have people who have been mentors to me and now I'm paying that back to them or we become kind of on that same level of just sharing ideas. So it's not also always that my mentor is somebody who's above me or more accomplished than me. Like it can, it, there's no rules really to who can or can't be a mentor. And so I think it's just important again, like I said, being curious and, hearing what people have to say and what their experiences have been. Yeah. A lot of people who are my mentors, they don't even know it. Like you said, I'll pick a person I've never met before and make him my mentor. Talk to me about just on the outside looking in, you have, you've won, right? You got the marriage, you got the kids, you got the career, you got the degree, you got everything that they said that we were supposed to go and get as young people. Talk to me about the added pressure because I do. I sit back and I see my amazing, beautiful wife and I see all of the things that she does, but then I see all of the pressure that she puts on herself and the pressure that comes from the outside world and expectations of what a mom is supposed to be and what a mm-hmm. career woman is supposed to be and what does it mean to be progressive and what's feminine, feminism mm-hmm. and all of these different things that are at play. Talk to me about how you manage all of those extra stresses, many of the things that men don't have to really think about, Mm -hmm. how do you manage that? Yeah, there's a lot of things that we're going to, that we're supposed to do, right, as a career woman and a working woman. And it's interesting. After I had my kids, I was so shocked by the number of people who were surprised that I worked. And I'm like, we're not in the, like, 1950s and it's like look at our society and our economy like I have to work like we don't have that I don't have that luxury of just not working and also like why and and I get it like I understand why it's a question for Google you have three kids they're really young like I never desired to be a stay-at-home mom and that wasn't something that I wanted but I did realize very quickly like how stretched I was right there's only so many hours in a day And I want to be 100% at work, 100% for my kids, 100% for my husband. But that's unrealistic, right? That's not possible every day. And so it took me a while, like when I had all of my children during the pandemic. So in some ways for me, it was a positive because it slowed everything down and there weren't all those outside distractions. So I had the ability to look at at the pandemic, which was a difficult time for a lot of folks, but in a way where I got time with my kids and I was able to really learn and hone who I wanted to be as a mom. And then what did this look like with work? And so a lot of times people are like, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you do it. Well, one, I just do because I have to, right? This is what I chose. This is the life that I chose. But I do it because I don't, I don't feel like I have to be the best at everything that I'm doing. I just have to be the best of what I can give, right? I, I Each day I'm going to have a different amount to give. And some days maybe I'm not the best mom and that's okay. And some days I'm not the best at work or I'm not productive. 
And that's also okay because we're all human beings. And as a woman, yeah, there I feel like there are those added stresses and pressures and you're always thinking. And so I like give I have a great therapist that helps me through a lot of that. My mental health is super important because if that's not if I'm not taking care of that, then I can't be the best of anything for anyone around me. Right. And I I'm not going to be fun and I'm not going to be able to do this and feel good about what I'm doing. So I've just taken like my approach being a mom and a working mom is that I don't have to make it complicated. Right. Mm -hmm. Even though it looks hard or it looks like how can you manage it? That's all a matter of perception. Like there and when it comes to like work life balance, as we talk, like we've talked about, like, I don't view that as a balance. Like my life will always be first. I love what I do for my career. I, I, I'm very fortunate to be in the position I've been. I've also worked really hard to get to a place where now I can live my life and I can prioritize my family, my kids, my friends, the things that make me happy. And my job allows me to do that. Right. I show up there every day, but like there's no balance. I'm I don't compare my life and my job on the same playing field whatsoever. Like life is always going to be first for me. It's interesting because the other lady that I had on the podcast who is also from Iowa, she's a professor at University of Iowa. And one thing she mentioned was the the benefits that academia gives in regards to prioritizing. I don't want to, I don't want to use the word work life balance. She has a little bit more flexibility as a professor. Was that your long-term focus? We were picking a career saying, maybe I want to um, take an academic, more academic route that may give me more of this flexibility. So if, and when I want to have a family, that, that option becomes more easy to do. Yeah. Honestly, for me, it wasn't like I, I got into higher education because of the experiences that I had with the advisors that I that advised me at Wisconsin. And I always felt like being on a college campus, the energy, the excitement, it's you get a new class of freshmen every year and they're excited to be badgers. And I like I love that. And I went to school here. So for me, like my job is so easy because I'm just kind of seeing like these new generations living out what we did the decade ago. And the flexibility is great, right? That's a, a huge added, added bonus. And I think ultimately that's the flexibility and this ability I have to prioritize my life will keep me in higher education. I don't know if it'll, it will be forever, but for right now, it really does allow me. I never have to choose working over my kids or anything that I want to do in my life. And I do think that's a huge benefit of working in higher education. But I think that more and more companies are starting to see that and understand that like to keep people and to retain them, you have to people. Are, we're all people, right? Like we all have families. We all have lives. Even if people don't have kids, they deserve to have flexibility and time away. And it shouldn't just always be a grind. And that just gets so unhealthy, that dynamic. And I you know, with my staff, I instill that like you have to be away from this. Otherwise, everyone grows to hate what they're doing or, or starts to resent what they're doing. And I always want to protect that for the folks that that work with me and for myself. Alexis, it was awesome talking to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today your wisdom, your insights on being able to manage what you've managed, accomplish what you've accomplished, I think will definitely help our viewers. And so thank you so much for, for speaking with us today. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This is awesome. <laughs>